Welcome to CNU Florida, day four. I am Allie Palmer with Kimley Horn. We also happen to be the sponsor of this particular session today. So welcome again on our behalf. I am going to make some introductions of our wonderful speakers today. We have Allison Justice, who is the, uh, a certified redevelopment professional, and she is currently serving as the deputy director of the West Palm Beach CRA. Uh, she has eight years of experience with RMA and another six years of experience with the city of West Palm Beach. She oversees a $42 million annual budget for the two CRA districts within the city of West Palm Beach. And she has served as project manager for major streetscape projects in the city, including the Banyan Boulevard uh, streetscape project. And of course, what we're talking about today, the Clematis Street streetscape project. Our other speaker today, last but certainly not least, Miss Anna Maria Aponte. She has 20 years in the public sector beginning in Columbia. But since 2003, she has been with the city of West Palm Beach. She is the city's urban designer and um, she is responsible for the downtown, implementing the downtown master plan. And this is a form based code that has successfully gu guided the redevelopment of the city's downtown district. She has participated in the design of several projects within the downtown area, including city commons, the waterfront park, and of course, the Clematis Streetscape project. So with that, I will leave it to them to continue guiding us through this presentation today. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali, for inviting us uh, to the CNU Summit. Um, we are very excited for the opportunity to share with you all the story of the transformation of uh, Clematis Street. I'm gonna share my screen now. We can start the presentation. A little bit of um, background history or context for those of you who are not familiar with West Palm Beach. West Palm Beach is uh, the county seat for Palm Beach. Uh, for Palm Beach, the county has a population of 1.5 million people, and the city has approximately 110,000 people. Downtown West Palm Beach is located um, on the east side of I-95 and uh, next to um, the Intracoastal Waterway, and um, is the historic uh, core of um, the city. It's approximately 780 acres and it includes the largest um, concentration of office uses in the city. The Madison Street, that is the street that we're gonna talk about today, is approximately eight block long street that connects the train station on the west side of downtown with the waterfront on the east side. I want to start the presentation with a little bit of history. Uh, because what we are experiencing today is not the product of one year or even two. It is the product of many years of transformation and the reflection of our community. In the early years, Clematis was the center of the commercial activity. It was the city's civic space. And if you can see in this picture from the 1920s, probably during the celebration, as you can see the people watching from the sidewalk looking at something that was like a parade. So it was definitely the civic space and the pride of the city. In a more regular day, um, the, the cars were parked on the center of the street and the commercial activity filled the adjacent buildings. As the cars uh, were fewer and also slower, the street was a common space where bicyclists, cars, pedestrians live and uh, roam together. Uh, and it was actually a shared street. That's where our story starts. As the years went by, um, the commercial activity remained on Clematis as the prime center of um, commerce in the city, but the cars gained more prominence. The sidewalk were no only, now only a space reserved um, for pedestrians, and its amenities uh, were minimum, um, with basically shade only provided by the awnings and no signs of any vegetation um, is seen on the pictures from the early days. In the 60s, you can see in this picture, the street was more like a thoroughfare um, with three lanes going in one direction towards the east, despite the street is only eight blocks long and doesn't really go long distance. 
and cars were parked on both sides. Despite uh, the large number of people walking in the street in, at these times, you still see that the majority of the space be, between the buildings was dedicated to the cars. Downtown was a vibrant space back then with a lot of um, workers and shoppers going on around the entire area. And this picture is interesting to see uh, is the corner of Olive and Clematis. And you can see the um, all way pedestrian crossing that we uh, all uh, highlight so much and like so much these times. Where in the 60s, we had it, it was there. And at some point we lost it. The things change after that with the Second World War, uh, war after the Second World War, war the, redevelopment, the development of the city changed and the pattern changed. The suburbs as it happened in many other cities throughout the country um, were uh, developed and people move out of the downtowns. The Palm Beach Mall opened in 68, attracting these new fancy stores with indoor AC and uh, basically changing the entire um, appearance and face of the downtown area. The businesses started to leave downtown. You can see in these uh, pictures that the scene was totally different. The downtown declined and few people could be seen in the streets. But the late 1980s, the street life in downtown was non-existent. Despite the fact that um, several large office buildings were built in the mid 80s, people came to the office and as soon as they finished, they left the downtown. There was no nightlife in downtown and it was actually perceived as a dangerous space, dangerous uh, place to stay. So people did not um, live, uh, stay in the restaurants or they were not restaurants or businesses any longer or few of them. A lot of the buildings were demolished at that time um, and uh, replaced by parking lots. And you can see in this picture, the large amount of uh, parking lots in the downtown. But um, city leadership still believe in the importance of the downtown, the value of the urban fabric and what we had in the downtown area. And several regulatory pieces were implemented to take us where we are now. The vision was to restore the downtown as an active and vibrant part of the city. And in 1985, the city adopted a community redevelopment plan and created a CRA, securing the resources to invest in the downtown. Ten years later, in 1995, the city adopted the downtown master plan, one of the first form-based codes in the country. Drafted by DPC, the plan created the regulatory framework to promote a mixed-use pedestrian scale downtown, a 24-hour city where you can live, work, and play. And that was kind of the start of the redevelopment of the downtown area. Along with the master plan, another thing that was implemented that was fundamental for the downtown was um, the adoption of the traffic concurrency exception area that allow an increase in the development capacity of the downtown without requiring any expansion of the roadway system. And to the contrary, was requiring the city to adopt alternative modes of transportation and promote a pedestrian environment. These actions that were taken more than 30 years ago have allowed the city to prioritize the construction of a people-centered public realm. The, the guiding principles are very simple. The construction of the public realm, the building form, the placement and the uses is directed to create a public realm that emphasizes people, how they comfortably use and enjoy the public space. And of course, this, um, the implementation of these principles have evolved over, over the years and um, have been defined and informed by how our community has also evolved in its perception of the importance of the public space and the spaces for people. In the case of Clamaris Street, um, the change of the community's desire is clearly seen. Uh, to its significance, Clematis has been transformed over the years to the present, um, to, the, to represent the community values. From the 1970s, where we have three 11 foot travel lanes in one direction with only 10 foot wide sidewalks and no shade or vegetation or kind of comfort for the pedestrians, 
we move to the 1990s when we have a new streetscape project that was advanced by a vision of uh, Mayor Graham to transform the downtown. And a streetscape project that widened the sidewalks, provided uh, shade on mid-block crossings, added palms to the street, and definitely included a new vision and character for the street where people were more important. We converted the three foot travel lanes into only two uh, travel lanes into, in, in two directions, and the sidewalks were widened into a 13 foot wide sidewalks. With that, uh, also, along with the construction of the streetscape, the city built a new fountain and plaza at the eastern terminal vista of the uh, Plumaris Street and set the tone for a uh, character on the street. So people were centered. And um, with kids gathering and the fountain and playing, and the, a new dynamic was definitely created. It was clear that um, the city was focusing on its citizens and how they enjoy the public realm. After the streetscape of the early 19s, the street evolved into a vibrant street with sidewalk, dining, and retail. As the years passed by, um, restaurant sidewalk seating became more popular. As you know, we didn't have sidewalk seating in, even in the early 80s. This is kind of a new thing that has become more popular in the cities. Um, the pedestrians started to be restricted in the sidewalks to narrow for the activity. So you can see in these pictures that you have the outdoor seating that is so desired and wanted by everybody. But it was limiting the movement of even regular people going to the street. And it was kind of a conflict between the, um, the uses. Also, the street had some issues with still back vacant spaces along the, the, its frontage. Some of the storefronts were not occupied. And we started to see issues with um, retail spaces and what is going on. It just transpired to what is going on right now with the right retail dynamics. Over the years, uh, different interventions were proposed by the city to address the issues affecting the street. But as uh, things change in the, in, the, in the 2008, when the city tried to do uh, certain interventions, the, um, the community was not still on board with dramatic changes. In a 2008 project, the city uh, proposed to uh, widen the sidewalks only two feet to convert this into just simple 15 foot uh, wide sidewalks by removing some of the parking spaces and planting some uh, shade trees. We received a lot of uh, pullback from the community. They didn't want the removal of the parking spaces. They still perceived parking was fundamental for the existence of the businesses on the street. And they actually were even uh, against the shade trees. They didn't want the shades to hide their signs. And they perceived that the image of the, of the street with palms was an identity for West Palm Beach. They didn't want sh shade trees at all. So the, the project that was originally planned for a more aggressive streetscape was pulled back and only uh, resulted in some um, changes for the light fixtures on the street. But we didn't give up and we uh, kept trying new things to show the community the advantages of a more um, enhanced pedestrian realm. We tried parking day in 2010 and then again in 2013 where we expanded some of the parking areas and replace them for um, seating areas. And after that, we try a pilot park, park it program in 2017. These, um, these programs, these two temporary implementations um, really gave the pers uh, a new perspective to the citizens and the residents of the downtown and show them how improvements could be made and they could be enjoying the space much more than the convenience of having a parking space in front of their Starbucks. After the temporary park parklets program uh, was uh, completed, the restaurant owners started to pressure the city actually for additional outdoor seating. And um, that is where, um, when we took uh, or advanced the idea of making a more aggressive uh, Clamaris Street. And that's where Alison is going to explain you in more detail now. Alison? Thank you, Anna Maria. Yes. I'm going to share my screen as well here. 
And again, thank you so much. Thank you, Anna Maria. Um, you know, if, if any of you on the call know Anna Maria, she is the queen of the downtown master plan in West Palm Beach. She is, <laughs> is, is, is very, very knowledgeable and, and was an integral part of this process as well. Um, and to Congress and the Urbanism for having us today. I'm going to go into really where we where we are now and how we got to this new streetscape, um, the design, and really from a project management perspective, what was what was the recipe for success? So why over the years when there was a lot of pushback and there was um, we had a, a difficult time really making the street what we knew would be a comfortable uh, a walkable street that would promote economic development. Um, on our main street, why we got so much pushback from it. So I'm going to start with the kind of some four elements that we think were key to this project. One being the vision, two, the team that we had in place, uh, the engagement process with the public that we went through, and a phased approach. This is a, a little unique that we went through this phased approach and didn't, um, didn't necessarily mean to start it like this, but it ended up being really a, a great benefit for this project that we phased it in the ways that we did. So with that, uh, the vision, uh, I, I would never start any, any conversation about something, you know, especially in a downtown and a, and a great project without talking about how important the vision is. And Anna Maria mentioned uh, Mayor Nancy Graham back in the 90s. She had a vision for downtown that really transformed uh, downtown West Palm Beach. And uh, similarly, Mayor Jerry, Jerry Moyu, um, who was a mayor for the last eight years, uh, she is no longer mayor, but she, she turned out at eight years, uh, really had the vision for West Palm Beach to be more walkable, more comfortable, uh, economically, you know, with economic growth and stability, and started a series of, of plans that we, we went through, one with Jeff Speck and a walkability study in downtown, we did um, a public life and public space survey, as well as a mobility plan and parking and transportation demand management study. And this really was to have efforts to engage the public, to, to show them how important the public space was and that what we could do if we, had, uh, if we, if we improved our public spaces. And this really was like a roadmap um, for the Clematis Streetscape Project. Also, uh, the vision of a curbless street. So, uh, Anna talked a little bit about, you know, Clematis Street in the past was a shared street. Uh, we really took our cues from some, some streets all over the world. Obviously, the Dutch Wooner was, uh, was very, is very popular in Europe. And we do have some curbless streets already in West Palm Beach. Rosemary Avenue downtown is a curbless street as well. But there was a little hesitation about um, how the drainage would work on a curbless street. Uh, how does it work between vehicles and pedestrians on a curbless street? Is there too much conflict? And uh, so there, it, it did take a lot of conversation with our design team when we, we talked about the vision of the, of the curbless street. Um, before I talk a little bit about the team, you know, I will start with the internal team. And again, uh, um, the mayor is on the, I guess, the, the left-hand side there uh, with our contractors. But uh, she she created in City Hall, this was a definitely, she created an environment in City Hall that uh, the vision spread throughout all departments, um, including the engineering department. And I don't know if we probably have some engineers on the phone, but I know a lot of you are, are planners and urban designers and landscape architects. And um, you know, sometimes we, we butt heads with the engineering department in the, in the conflict of, of uh, what's best for the urban space and, the, and mobility. So we really, had a team, uh, starting with the mayor and the engineering department, her assistant city administrator, Scott Kelly, who was very, um, very bullish as well on, on creating spaces for people, um, creating transportation with all modes, all modes of transportation were, were considered in the project. So the internal team we had was, we had uh, myself, I was a project manager for the CRA. The CRA was the funding agent. Uh, also, the uh, 
project manager for the city is no longer with us, but I want to give him a shout out, um, Eric Ferguson. He's uh, with the city of Boca Raton now, but uh, you know, Eric really in his heart, he's an engineer and he was very, very concerned about the safety and how we were going to design this road, but he was also passionate about knowing what was, what was right for this road and for the downtown. So he, he pushed this along just as much as, as we all did. And uh, we wouldn't be here without without his passion for this as well. So um, other team members internally, obviously Anna Maria, uh, we worked with uh, every department, parks and rec, community events, everybody that uses street police, fire, obviously everyone has to be involved in this internally. And of course the DDA, the West, West Palm Beach does have a downtown development authority. They are critical in our um, engagement with our businesses downtown and uh, were a very, very important part of this process as well. So when we when it came to selecting the team for design, we were we were pretty. I, I would say we were very deliberate in. Oops, I'm sorry. I need to get back to that. <laughs> well, there we go. And you'll see over on the right hand side, um, I don't know, many of you probably know Victor Dover. I think Victor's on the call. Uh, we selected Dover Cole and Partners as our designer along with Kim Lee Horn. Uh, Dover Cole was, you know, Victor Dover wrote the book on downtown street design. So we, we felt it was very important to have him as a part of our team. Um, he, he worked alongside Kim Lee Horn. Kim Lee Horn, uh, their project manager was Jonathan Haig, who's a landscape architect, was also very vital in this this process because he, he he shared the vision and the team shared the vision and then finally uh definitely last but not least is the is who's constructing your street from the contractor and how are they going to work with the businesses uh Burkhart construction is a uh is i would say in florida probably the best downtown urban uh streetscape contractor and uh really have white glove service and take care of the businesses as they're as they're constructing this project. Next would be the public engagement process. So, you know, when we started the public engagement, we obviously start with the with the merchants um, and the main stakeholders, Chamber of Commerce, the DDA board, uh, mayor and commissioners. We had meetings with all of them. Uh, we did a uh, planning at the market, which was at our green market, and this engaged people that use Clematis Street. So uh, we wanted to catch people in the environment when they don't normally maybe attend public meetings, but um, would come to the green market and stopped by and gave their design ideas, as well as uh, Victor was here and held an interactive workshop with um, with the public as well. So during this whole process, Dover Paul was really able to incorporate the wishes of the community and they really heard how the vision had evolved over the prior attempts. At this point, you know, most people were on board with narrowing traffic lanes, with adding sidewalk width, with uh, reducing parking. So uh, they really heard this from the community. And in, in summary, again, what they found was Everyone chose to narrow the lanes, lessen or eliminate traffic lanes. They wanted to make a safe space for bicyclists and parking for bicyclists, uh, less parking spaces. And then, and then most everyone wanted increased shade and increased space for dining and um, pedestrian seating. You'll also see here that uh, we had a poll at the public meeting and we did have an option here um, for a either build one block or did I skip a slide Anna Maria? We had an option for build one block or uh, the right way I guess or uh, do small improvements on each of the blocks. I'm going to go back here because I think I missed a yes. Oh, I missed the I missed the slide. So, really, what I what I wanted to convey was we did have a budget on this. Uh, our first phase, we had a budget of two million dollars, and this is where we needed to answer the question when we went through the public engagement process of, you know, do you want one ideal block uh, that we will design, or do you want the five 
you know, minor improvements to the five blocks. And it was overwhelming what they wanted. But obviously when they gave those answers, they, they also said, but we want the investment to be made to construct the remainder of the street. And that gave obviously the politicians and the elected officials the desire to, to fund the remainder of the project moving forward. So uh, last but definitely not least was the phased approach that we went through in the design of this, uh, of this streetscape. We started with the 300 block of Clamata Street. We did one block. Uh, again, we had a $2 million budget. Uh, it ended up being two and a half million. We, we modified the budget as we moved forward. Um, Clamata Street was approximately 520 feet. And you can see it in relation to City Hall as well as the Centennial Fountain and uh, the, the Virgin Brightline Station. Uh, the reason we selected the three, ended up selecting the 300 block was it did have the most number of vacancies. It would have been the least disruptive of in const during construction. Uh, the 200 block has probably the most restaurants. The 500 block is very unique and didn't want us to start on the 500 block. So uh, this is where we started the project and we were going to construct during the summer months, which obviously in Florida and South Florida is the off season. In the remainder of the phases, phases two and three, we selected the two and 100 blocks. So instead of dragging it out for you know one block at a time, uh, we worked with our contractor to make sure they could complete the project through the through the summer to do three blocks at a time. So the 100 and 200 blocks were done uh, were completed in 2019, and we are currently completing phase three. The 400 and 500 blocks are already open. They're still doing some landscaping and completing some things on the four and 500 block. And they're gonna make some minor improvements to the 600 block. It's a different, it's really outside of the core of the, the downtown. Um, currently they're working to, uh, the city also upgraded the fountain uh, at Centennial Square, have a whole new interactive fountain that they've built. And currently our contractor is putting the pavers on the, on the top layer of the, the deck of the new fountain. So this will all be complete by November of this year. So how do we add the, you know, how do we add the value in this, in this design? What did this design end up looking like? Obviously, we had heard from the public they wanted the wider sidewalks. Um, we knew we were going to create a curbless street which prioritized the pedestrian and made the street more flexible. Uh, we had more sh add more shade trees, additional dining and seating areas, narrower traffic lanes. And the narrow traffic lanes, you know, really acted to slow that traffic, you know, to create the friction, to slow the traffic, to make it a more of a shared space and comfortable for all modes of travel. The design speed was under 20 miles an hour. As you can see from this diagram, well, we went from a 26, and 26 foot width of the roadway to uh, 18 foot with two with four feet of valley gutter, gutter. So it was really 10 feet travel lanes using the valley gutter as, um, as part of that. And Anna Maria kind of showed you this, but really some of the challenges was, you know, how do you, how do you put everything that needs to be in the sidewalk and in that space um, and create, create enough, um, space for pedestrians, you know, really, you only had about eight and a half feet, even though the, the, the sidewalk was 13 feet, light poles, you have conflicts, uh, you can see you have dining chairs, very little space for people to um, actually walk between the, the, the dining areas. Uh, let's see, and we also, uh, let me go, go here. You can see this picture on the right is actually shows you really the lack of shade. Uh, back in the 90s, we added the tr mid block trees. Uh, those were the only shade trees on the block and the rest were palms. So here's, here were some of the solutions uh, that we had during the design process. Uh, the large shade trees, uh, obviously, we didn't want another 20 years to go by before we had shade on the street. So these are all eight inch caliper, over 25 foot trees that we've installed on Clamata Street. 
We use suspended pavement systems to encourage the root growth. Uh, there are permeable pavers in the parking spaces uh, for drainage. Of course, we have high-end materials with the pavers uh, on the sidewalks, large-scale pavers on the sidewalks and pavers on the street. And then, of course, the valley gutter, which created the curbless street. Phase one of this project was complete on uh, at the end of October in 2018. So we, we constructed from June to uh, through October, had a ribbon cutting on November 2nd, 2018. Um, it was, you know, we had a, a big fanfare and obviously people were very excited with it. Um, and the rest of the blocks were very excited to move forward with with the phasing of their projects as well. This is just a couple of pictures of the 300 block after it's complete. You can see there's a, a trolley and bicycles and, and people using the street. I think this this uh, first one was before we had really opened the street much, um, this drone shot. So we moved, we moved on to the phase, phases two and three. We did learn some lessons and this is where, this is where the benefit of the phased approach really came into play. Uh, there, there was some concern. We did get some media on, are, it, are the roads too narrow? Is it really a one way? Um, you can see obviously there's two trolleys going beside each other. They do fit. Um, it is tight. It is supposed to be, um, it's not supposed to be super comfortable for the vehicles. Uh, but we did make some adjustments. Adjustments. We shifted some corner baller placements to um, make the turning, turning radiuses a little better. We moved some bollards. We had more direct stakeholder conversations. We made it more flexible. So where on the 300 block, we didn't have retractable bollards everywhere. We put retractable bollards on parking spaces so we could make them dining spaces and vice versa. So um, really made, made it much more flexible in the future phases. We also had some enhanced marketing campaigns for the merchants. Uh, we understand obviously how this impacts merchants downtown when you have your, your main street under construction. So we really wanted to alleviate some of that. So we had a campaign and you can see the pedestrian barricades down below that we used um, as well as, you know, we had some a tagline there. We had some, some TV ads um, and encouraging people to come downtown and trying to help people navigate through downtown when they were, when they were down here. So uh, really tried to continue to get people to come downtown even while we were at our construction. And with that, we just go kind of over the timeline and I, I briefly mentioned this, but this has been a, it's been a, it started out as a pretty rapid process. It's been going on for three years. However, it was, it was, it was always the same timing. So we had public engagement from November. We started November of 2017. We uh, to, to February of 2018, and then we started construction June through October. Phase two, we moved up just slightly. The construction, we were able to get the design done, done a little sooner, so we started in May. Although there were three blocks, so uh, we did go through December uh, 2019. We did a we did a grand opening. The picture on the right is a ribbon cutting on the 200 block that uh, we did in October of of 2019. Uh, once again, the public engagement on the third phase happened in November 2019 through February 2020. Uh, we did move up the construction uh, due to COVID. We were, we were not quite ready to go, but again, with a good team on board that we've had for the last three years, they were able to mobilize and start construction early. Uh, they started in April 2020. The 400 and 500 blocks opened on Labor Day to traffic, so they are not 100% with landscaping, but they are open uh, to both pedestrians and to vehicles. Uh, and the 600 block is still under a little construction. So in total, we have uh, seven blocks. Six were a complete rebuild. Uh, one has some minor improvements. Uh, the total cost of the project uh, over the three phases is 17 million. The CRA did end up issuing bonds for this, uh, to fund this, as well as for some other streetscape projects we have uh, going on in the downtown. So with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Anna Maria to wrap us up. 
Thank you, Alison, um, for that presentation, very detailed presentation about the process on, on Clomaris. I think it's, it's important that um, we want to kind of finish this presentation with um, some um, kind of message that really resonates for us um, in the city and is that the construction of the public realm is really an ongoing process. And uh, Alison described how we did this project in three years, but it basically has taken the city more than 30 years to recover Clematis Street as we see it today. We have been moving slowly towards that with incremental projects, little interventions, convincing the community that, that the, the environment for people, it, it is a good investment and will bring uh, benefits for the city and its citizens. So to where we are with this shared street, we were able to move and transform really the city when in the 17s, the, the, the public realm on Clematis Street was basically only 28% of, of that um, environment was dedicated for people and the rest was focused on cars. On the design that was just completed, 55% of the space is dedicated for people. So it's really a shift on the dynamic of this street and how the priorities are placed. Um, I, we, we strongly believe that with the latest version of Clematis Street, the city has expressed its value. Its values. It's uh, it's the importance given to the people, uh, and the seer, and the desire to create a more inclusive environment where uh, paying customers at a restaurant uh, enjoying a beautiful evening in the city uh, are as as important as uh, simple pedestrians that just want to walk and stroll on the street and are not uh, basically paying for anything. So we have given priority for to every citizens uh, that can enjoy the public realm, make it really an engaging space for anyone. Um, we are also, the new version of Clomatis Street is a flexible and open uh, for new activities and multiple combinations. In these pictures, you can see like, at some point there were some activities that were doing yoga in the middle of the street and it's a pleasant environment and people enjoy the activity and it's a space for all and can change, can transform and be flexible and adapt. And um, one of the, of the important things for this is that we, we were not expecting this, but actually the emergency with the COVID-19 has, has kind of, it was a good test for the design of Clamaris Street. With the curbless design, the street was ready to adapt for what is, was needed. Uh, the restaurants were able to expand the seating on the sidewalk. There were spaces to put tents out and allow the restaurants to serve uh, the customers outside in the safety of, of the outdoor environment. So that has, has been very um, satisfactory for us to see that the design that was put in place has really um, met the goal of making this a flexible street and, and sharing it and make it like a vibrant space for the city. Um, we're looking forward definitely to how the street evolves uh, from here. The project is completed, but as, as we say, uh, the process um, is still continuous and we'll see what the citizens want to do with the street now, how uh, the uses are changed and how it evolves over the time. So with that, uh, we conclude our presentation. Uh, we'd like to hear if anyone has questions, we're here to answer. And thank you very much for inviting us. Thanks so much, Anna Maria. Okay. Um, well, I must admit my my favorite of that entire all that phasing and process must have been the the great branding of the iconic cones all <laughs> over Clematis. <laughs> I think I'll remember that for the rest of my life. That was just it was a great job. Uh, well done, as well as everything that you all did to make this project happen. So thank you. Uh, we do have one question and I do encourage everybody, we do have a few minutes for a Q&A before our next session begins, um, which I'll plug here in a minute. It looks like we've got one from Rick. So I, uh, I'll read that out loud to you all and Anna Maria and, and Allison, you can decide uh, who wants to answer this. He says, <laughs> In true Rick style, oh my gosh, where did the traffic go? <laughs> Congestion must be terrible. Okay, kidding aside, but what do you tell people from the last century that seriously ask about these congestion questions? <laughs> 
Well, I, I, I will, I just want to say hi, Rick. I, I haven't spoken to Rick in a while. I, I, we, he worked with us on another project in, in, in West Palm Beach. So uh, I'm very, he's very well aware of, uh, of our issues with congestion, I guess. Uh, but luckily, I think with, with Clamata Street, uh, in Anna Maria, you can jump in here as well. Um, they, the people that use Clamata Street, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, nighttime activities on Clamata Street as well. And one of the complaints always was a lot of people like to cruise it, like they do a, uh, a, a downtown square, I guess, um, which people on the street don't don't love. So I don't know that we had a lot of pushback on congestion. Our issue was more with removing of parking spaces. And Anna, what, do you, did, what did you hear or anything on? Yeah, I think, I mean, probably during the busiest times in the evenings, um, maybe there's still cars moving slow, but I think that is part of the attraction of the street. So uh, during regular days, the street moves fine. Um, we still have the UPS store dry, uh, stopping in the travel lane, but as the speed is, is actually slower now, I don't think people get bothered for it any longer, by it any longer, because they know it is a slow street, it is a different pace, they are not, if you, you now more than before, if you uh, want to go fast, you don't go on Clamatis, you know, this is a different type of street, it's a different environment, so I think that has actually, the design has reinforced this, that is a street that is for a slow movement, and people kind of respect that. Um, I think we had more issues um, with people not believing that the cars could fit on the street. When uh, we were designing the first uh, phase, we had uh, people really on social media screaming that that was only a one-way street and two-way will not fit and cars could not pass. So it was interesting when finally the first block opened and we tested and uh, people realized that you could fit the cars and it was not a big deal. Even the fire department has the, the fire truck and they say, okay, that's fine. So it was, it was a very interesting process of people recognizing that, I mean, the dimensions that were before were uh, not needed for this street. Thank you both, and so true from experience. <laughs> we, had, we had several, we had a lot of people thinking that we, we tried to pull the wool over their eye and we actually built a one-way street. It was, <laughs> they were convinced we. <laughs> That's our goal in life, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to block traffic. Uh, we have a couple other questions regarding parking. So um, there's two questions that are similar. So I'm gonna actually speak those at the same time. Uh, Michael Houston asks, how worried were the business owners about the loss of on-street parking and what was the parking strategy? And then my, Mitchell Austin adds to that by saying, how many parking spaces were removed per block or over the entire six blocks? Yeah, I don't. So the per block, it varied per block. So uh, I believe we went from, you know, I used to have those numbers, but um, 20 some odd parking spaces on uh, the 300 block alone down to um, maybe 10 or 15. Uh, on the 200 block, we went from maybe maybe 18 to five because there were mostly restaurants and they all wanted they all wanted dining space. So they were not, we had a couple of retail stores. Obviously we put um, handicap spaces on all blocks. Uh, we, uh, there was some concern. Obviously, some retailers have a, a larger concern. Are the Starbucks? We put a parking spot um, in front of the Starbucks. Um, but luckily, the city has two garage, three garages right off of Clamata Street. So um, the parking strategy is there are there there's ample parking, and luckily we have done the parking transportation demand management studies um, showing that we wouldn't be impacted. We want there to be some parking on Clematis, but we want it to be, you know, premium parking that people can run in and grab their coffee and, and do what they need to, to do. It was also interesting that, um, as, as Alison was saying, the 300 block still had um, the design still remains with a, a large number of on-street parking. 
And one of the of the process of the space process was as we went by with the design, actually the businesses came back and say, no, 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 we don't want uh, parking in front of ours. We want actually the outdoor seating. So they kind of changed their perspective um, when they saw the result. And the 500 block, um, some of the businesses like were like, we want just one parking space, and then the other ones can be dedicated for on street for um, outdoor seating and not have more than than the minimum necessary so that was a, an interesting dynamic during the three-year long process wonderful thank you both um, we do have another question from mitchell uh, he's asking what is the process for one to open a block and close to cars is it only the city or businesses along the street that can do that um, and when can that be done well, one, one um, process that is happening right now is we have um, right now the 500 block of Clamatis that was the last block to um, get their, um, up their project done. Uh, even before the project, they had already um, kind of started to discuss with the city the idea of closing the street. Um, they wanted permanently, but the city was not uh, convinced yet that we could do it. So we uh, kind of work with them and they are now doing a weekend closure. So they obtain a special event permit from the city to allow them to close the street. That is one block uh, from Friday. I think they are closing at five or something like that. Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And they are activating the street. Um, one of the pictures that I show in the presentation during the COVID is them putting tables out on the street and they have uh, activities for the kids. They have cornhole and they have ping pong tables and they have different things. Um, so that one was um, done through a special event permit coordinated with the city. Um, we, that is one part of the process that is going to go. We are now revisiting our sidewalk cafe regulations to implement a more detailed regulation, not only for Clematis, but for the rest of the city. And also we're going to uh, have um, new um, guidelines of how to do that type of events. Also, the um, the special events for converting on street parking into outdoor seating, maybe on evenings, on weekends, and that type of thing. So that will be kind of the next step that we are working with the business. And, and right I, now, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think that I, I believe it requires 80% of the merchants or property owners, I don't know if it's business owners or property owners, to um, agree to shut the street down. Um, and obviously, the city has to agree to it as well. But um, but that's still an administrative process, Anna Maria? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay, it looks like we have one more question for now. This is an anonymous attendee. They'd like to know, uh, were any transit options added or increased to compensate for parking spaces? And maybe you wanna talk about the, um, the bike share here as well. Yeah, I mean, I, we didn't mention, but Clematis has a trolley route that connects uh, Clematis Street, where it makes kind of a loop Actually, it's two different routes that go one to the other, the city place of Rosemary Square that is a, a retail um, area within the downtown also. And then another route that is a commuter route that goes to the train station and connects different um, larger employers throughout the downtown. So that route existed before. It has existed since the, uh, 2000 and it is still in place. We have the stops still in place and will remain operational. Um, we have um, the bike uh, or the the bike uh, scooter share system. Uh, before we have specifically bike shares, it was a sky bike. And now the city has uh, issued an RFQ that it was awarded to a particular uh, provider that will provide uh, bikes and scooters that will be located throughout the downtown area and different areas of the city. So those, um, that one is not in place yet, but we're moving forward to uh, deploy that. Yeah, so, and, um, as, and as Anna mentioned, our uh, both train station, both the, the Brightline Virgin station, as well as the Tri-Rail station, which connects Miami and, and West Palm Beach, are within, um, within a half mile of the core of downtown, which are both connected with the trolley route. So um, uh, the, the Virgin station is right off of Clematis Street, and um, Tri-Rail station is off of Clematis Street, but it's little, it's uh, the, I guess, 700s down probably three blocks down. So that does is connected through trolley. So we have a pretty good connection of other, other mobility options once you get into the city. 
that's phase 2025, right? Right. <laughs> to get down to tri-rail. <laughs> It'll happen one day. <laughs> now, actually, um, this, the 700 block of Clematis was completed, um, Anna, probably mm, five, like six, five years, six yeah, years ago. Six years ago. That's true. Uh, and the 600 block is the only other block that was not complete, which we're, we are making improve. We're adding lighting. Um, we're making some improvements on sidewalks and adding some shade trees. So mm -hmm. uh, there is a, a condo on one side and a police station on the other side. So it's a, it's, it's a very different uh, block than when you start the 500 block, so. Great, well, I don't see any more questions in the queue at the moment. There are some, um, oh, sorry, there is one comment here in the chat from Ken Sides. Uh, he remarks, and maybe you wanna comment on this, uh, very interesting that the parklet was the key to breaking the intransigence of the very merchants who stood to and did benefit from the street changes. The dynamic should be presented at the next Parklet conference <laughs> if there is such a thing, <laughs> or at yeah. least published in a planning or engineering journal. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it was definitely interesting because we, uh, we got uh, the parklet uh, program. It was we drafted regulation to implement the parklets. It was, of course, a very restrictive because the engineers didn't want uh, the parklets that close to travel lane. So it was kind of a process to convince our own um, internal group that we could have uh, actually expanded uh, outdoor seating. And then as we launched the, the parklets, the merchants started to look into it. They, some of them actually um, submitted some proposals and did some drawings. And at that same time that they were doing that, the city decided to move ahead with the street escape. So we had some merchants come back to us and say, oh, can we get reimbursed for the money that we put on the design as you are doing the street escape? So what do we do? So it was a very interesting process to, to talk yeah. with that. And yeah, on. interestingly enough, we found it easier to rebuild the entire street than to get a parklet in the city. Yes. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, oh, there's another comment here from Victor. He says, we're working on an illustrated open source document now for the DDA to share their techniques for repurposing parts of the downtown streets for social distancing. Stay tuned. <laughs> Next year's session, I suppose. Yeah. Next year's session, yes. Great. Well, thank you both so much. This was Great session and uh, made me feel like I'm in South Florida again for a little bit. I appreciated that. <laughs> Thank <laughs> and you, always Ali, good for to see us. your faces. Um, I will do the plug for the next session. We have our unvacant lot social hour. So I believe the competition winner will be announced at that time if you want to join us. Um, I believe it's starting at 5.30. 30. I know that that's what it said in the invite that you received um, in your email to the link for the Zoom meeting. But um, there was also uh, the, on the agenda, I said, if, I believe it said 545. So, oh, excuse me. All right. Thank you, Artie and Laurel. It's 545, not 530. <laughs> mm -hmm. So please join us at 545 for the Unvacant Lot Social Hour. And again, thank you for joining the summit and our session today. And have a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allie.